Hello, everybody, and welcome back. This is podcast number three. Yeah, podcast number three, I believe. Uh, today, my guest is the very popular, very sexy, glasses wearing goodness, Matthew Connolly. Say hi, Matt. Hey, all. <laughs> Matt is a longtime friend of mine, and do you want to do some self-promotion for your stuff coming out in the future, or...? Uh, I do have a project I'm working on. I'm currently trying to set up a channel on YouTube called Matt's Gats. It's mostly going to be guns, knives, and gear. Uh, it's not up there yet, so look for me in the near future, but don't expect anything spectacular. It's a GoPro and me on my weekends. All right. Well, if you want to see Matt on a GoPro with a GoPro on his weekends, I'll uh, I'll have a link to that up in the description for this. Whenever he's live and ready, or on and good to go, and uh, yeah. So today uh, we were going to talk a little bit about the idea of console gaming and sort of what where consoles stand, where they stand in relevance to PC, and the idea of We've got this whole set of, this generation of games that are being released simultaneously on both. Now, Matt here, uh, from what I hear, uh, you're mostly a console gamer, is that correct? Yes. And uh, you were talking about some of the games you played uh, before we started. Can you just give us a list of sort of some of the, some of the big ones you play on console? Uh, I think most of my time on console, at least in the past two years, has been committed to things like uh, Deus Ex Human Revolution, uh, CSGO, uh, probably two or three of the Fallouts, so Fallout New Vegas, Fallout 3, things like that. So there's a, a pretty wide variety. It's probably a mix of RPG and maybe online shooters. Okay. Now, I noticed a lot of the titles you list there... Um... Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure all of them are also available on PC game on PC, and a lot of them I think are PC games, sort of ported over to console. Uh, can you just like give me a qu quick explanation as to you know why you chose to do uh, console for these games as opposed to a PC counterpart? You know, it almost sounds odd, but I think in a lot of cases console just seems to be a little bit more of a comfortable entertainment system for me. I know a lot of the time I look at my laptop as, you know, it, it can do everything at once and it's portable, so that that should be better. But for some reason or another, a lot of these games, uh, like CSGO even, uh, Deus Ex, if I'm going to play them, I don't think to myself, hey, I'm going to sit down, turn on my laptop, and, you know, breeze through it. I think to myself, okay, I'm going to pick up a controller and, you know, I'm going to get really involved in this. So I guess, to me, it's just something about, there's there's something, maybe it's a tactile thing, but there's something much more enjoyable about playing games on a console rather than PC. Now, I, I mean, I myself, um, I've always sort of gone out of my way to have everything. I mean, I actually don't have uh, an Xbox One or a Wii U. But, you know, I've always, prior to this generation, I've always sort of had a PC as well as all of the consoles just so I could see all of the uh, available content. Um, but one thing that people really always talk about when they talk about, you know, like PC Master Race, you got to get it on PC, is this idea of the modding community and what you can do to sort of modify and change a game. Like what? Just what? Just what are your your views on like mods or the lack of modding on? I I think mods certainly draw people in a lot more, and because they're absent on console, you know, you don't have that capability to do. You know, sometimes it's just silly things, stupid things. Like one of the uh, mods that I love in Skyrim is simply uh, adding some. Uh, I think it's a weapon pack that's from Lord of the Rings. And, like, I love the Lord of the Rings series. I like to nerd out a bit and use the weapons from that series in that game. On a console, I can't do that. Now, that's changed a little bit. I mean, particularly with Skyrim, I know they just re-released it 
uh, for the next gen consoles and they are including mods. But with the computer, I, I know with consoles, they still have to release some of those. With the computer, everything's kind of already there. You can already use it. Now, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a guy that's got, you know, all those, especially the Bethesda games on, on, well, with the exception of, of one, which I'll get to in a minute, but I have them all on PC as opposed to, to console. But one thing that always bothers me is, I mean, I love mods uh, that fix bugs in the games. I love mods that clean up the UI. I mean, Skyrim is like a perfect example of like shittiest, least friendly. Getting through those menus where you have to like wade to one side and then. But, you know, I. I've never. I have the option for them because I'm a PC gamer, but I've never really seen the appeal in like player added quests or player added expansion packs. And I mean, I've been, you know, I've been playing Baldur's Gate since it's released. I've been playing like some of the most games with the largest mod communities on the planet. And no matter how well done they are, and I mean, I've seen mods that have been made by groups that go on to actually be development companies. They never seem to quite fit into the game world seamlessly. I mean, it can be lore friendly. It can be like well-written, full voice acted. They always seem to stick out like a sore thumb, like no matter how well done they are. And so, and that's always bothered me. I know people say like, oh, this, this mod, you know, you go and you do this quest and it's got a really good story in its own right and it's amazing and it makes it worth playing the game again. And then I'll go try it out and I'll be playing it. I'll be like, this doesn't, doesn't feel like Skyrim. This feels like what someone thought Skyrim should be. Well, and that's, uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head with it, I think. I mean, with a lot of those mods... It's a different person creating that. It's a different company. It's a different group of people who are making that particular mod or that storyline or that add-on. So a lot of the time what you get is kind of other people's interpretations. Now, I know the mod I mentioned might be kind of a bad example because it's, it's Lord of the Rings. It's like an entire separate lore. It's an entire separate thing. Right. But if, if somebody was to create just a simple weapons pack, that you know you could put into Skyrim, and the weapons seemed a little bit off. Or they may seem cool or have a cool effect, but they're not necessarily what you know. They don't feel like they're from what is it, Tamriel, right. or from Skyrim itself. I, I'd say it's 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 almost like a, a another artist coming in and trying to add on to a painting or some kind of art piece. Like yeah, there's some individuality in it, and that's why it doesn't feel quite right. It may feel yeah. good, but not natural. I think art's a good comparison, too, because you think about, you know, there are people that can study Van Gogh their entire life, and then with modern technology and crazy analytics, they'll try to make a knockoff Van Gogh and, and sell it. But somebody who's an expert can always tell, you know, no matter how close it is and how it looks to, like, a general the general public, how spot on it could be, you can... You can tell. I mean, there's something about like the master's touch to the way they move their brush that nobody can nobody can imitate. And I mean, I don't want to necessarily say like Skyrim or any other game that like that is you know a masterpiece because they all have flaws. But you can just tell that it had sort of a different a different artist behind it doing. I think that's like a, a great comparison. Now the other thing is sort of capability um you, you know you said you're working on a laptop laptops until very recently have been notorious for sort of having trouble running current gen stuff do you have access to a pc that can run like modern games or presently no uh i'm i'm I, i've talked to people about putting together my own pc to make sure it has the right capabilities so i can game with it but i've, I've of course run into some of those problems with my laptop you know I, I think the first, I, I've gone through two or three laptops in the past couple of years. I think the first one I had, it was around 2011, 2012. And I even remember playing things like Deus Ex and not having the correct graphics capabilities that I needed. And that's always kind of a bummer when it comes to the laptop and PC world, when you don't have what you thought you had. But that's, I don't know if it's that much of a challenge, especially like I mentioned, you 
you can put together your own thing. It's not that difficult to change parts of the machine. Right. Well, I think that's also, you know, as technology advances, less, I mean, you know, the, the top end graphics card and things like that still changes every six months, but um, they're doing a better job of making ones that can at least run things on low settings for a couple of years afterwards. I know my, my PC is uh, about a year old now. And when I replaced it, I replaced a PC from 2009, and the graphics card in that PC was still running games on high and ultra that were being released today, and it's 2009. And it's because, you know, I had a very, very expensive card from 2009, but the point stands that it could still handle things. But I remember being, you know, a kid growing up in the 90s, and my first computer hit a point where it could no longer run current uh, current gen stuff, or well, what was current gen stuff. And it was so devastating, because I remember I like saved up money and bought a game, and then it just it didn't work. And I, I couldn't, you know, upgrading, uh, upgrading my graphics card or something was a little out of my league for like a nine-year-old. Um, you know, I'm not like one of the Grolo brothers that grows up constantly assembling PCs. And it was also, you know, it was something that I couldn't afford on my own. So yeah, it's easy to upgrade a, upgrade a PC, but at the same time, I feel like before you're sort of older and have, you know, you're capable of attain, obtaining your own income and things like that, it's very, very difficult sort of have a PC and swap out the parts. And a generation of consoles lasts longer than, like, a single generation of graphics card or processor. Well, and I think there may be in some of the light for, or, you know, some of the positives for console gaming. I mean, not, not only to young people, but people who are just, well, maybe I don't want to use the word lazy, but if you don't have the time or energy to get right. involved, I mean, I, I actually can compare this to the firearms world pretty easily. I mean, if you... Uh, Take the, the, I don't know what, the AR-15. It's the most popular rifle in America right now. And a lot of people will choose to build their own. A lot of people don't want to do that. They'll just buy their own. Right. They'll just buy a platform that has, you know, a couple of things that they need on it. Same thing with consoles. You can get really involved in it if you have the time, if you have the energy, if you have the money, and figure out what parts you want and what capabilities you need and all that jazz. But sometimes you don't want to do that. Sometimes you just want to lay down 200, 300 bucks all at one time and, you know, get something base. And I suppose that's kind of what consoles are these days. That's it's interesting though, that you mentioned that it's like the base model. It's the easy alternative because I feel like consoles are really shifting that way because I remember, you know, the age of console exclusives where it's not only something was, you know, not available on PC, it was only available on one console. And a lot of those games were, in fact, good enough to carry consoles. I mean, for years. You think of, like, you know, think about all the iconic titles on the N64, things like Donkey Kong 64, or, you know, Ocarina of Time. Or, you know, PlayStation had its, its Metal Gear Solid. Uh, Xbox, I'm sure, also had some... Um, I had Xbox and Xbox 360 significantly less than um you know what I my sound setting might have only been picking up partially this whole time real quick test test Okay, I apologize if you're watching this retrospect or after the fact on YouTube and I was cutting out at the end of my sentences. I, my noise gate had not been reset since I got a new microphone. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's an interesting point because there's, you know, when you buy all the games you said you've been playing on console are games that are readily available on PC. And when you buy one these days, you're buying like the plug-and-play no effort version of a PC almost. You know, you really don't see these console exclusive titles anymore. The only one that comes to mind is uh, FromSoft's Bloodborne on the PS4. And I gotta say, that was that game was easily worth 
the price of a PS4. I think I've probably got like three or four hundred hours into it at this point. But you know, it's it like what happened? <laughs> what happened in the industry that sort of got rid of console exclusives? I mean, maybe that it just wasn't. Uh, when you talk about console exclusives, to tell you the truth, my mind goes straight to the ones that are stereotypical. Like, uh, think of Halo. That think was the Xbox maybe, one, yeah, Halo. Think of, think of Uncharted. And I can imagine that sitting, sitting at one of those companies and like sitting at your desk and being responsible for marketing or something like that and seeing that other company come out with a game that brings in you know, X amount of dollars in revenue and thinking, wow, we, we don't have something like that. Or maybe we do have that game and we're not you know, bringing in that much from it. I, I think there's certainly a bit of competitiveness that didn't exist before because all platforms didn't have that kind of success. I mean, I, Stuart, your gaming experience definitely goes back a little bit farther than mine. I think I started, my first console was something like uh, the Nintendo GameCube. Nice. And I remember in days with like the GameCube and the Xbox and just PS2, I, I don't remember having as much issue. I don't remember you know, seeing a game on another console and being like, oh, my God, I have to have that. Oh, come and, and, on. Metal Gear Solid 2 is great. Well, and see, but I never, I, I may have heard about that, but I was content playing, you know, Super Mario Sunshine or something like that. But then you see stuff like Halo, and it did make you kind of jealous. I, I mean, not even talking about from a company standpoint, I'm talking about just gamer standpoint. Right. You, you sit down and... So why don't we why don't we see that as much anymore? I mean, there's way less console exclusives than there used to be. And as far as you know, I you can make the argument that from a developer standpoint, you know, you wider audience base, more money, things like that. But console gaming, at least in the United States, has I mean, you know, the the industry is not in, the gaming industry itself is not in good shape. Let's just go ahead and. and put that out there because it has the highest employee turnover rate and more companies going belly up than any other industry in America. But as far as sales go, I think console sales are still beating PC sales for the for the most part. And you have to ask these hardware developers, you know, think please companies like Sony and Microsoft are they really not willing to shell out enough money for the ex the uh, the exclusive title because that's that's how it happens I mean that's how that's how we got you know that's how we got a modern day console exclusive like Bloodborne that's why you look at the older titles things like um what's the name of that one well I just forgot the name of that game the one with the 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 guns that one that, yeah that no, one with I'm the sorry. Shit! You're right. You spend the. Wait, are you are you going like Goldeneye? Are you going old old? Oh or what? oh oh! I was going for um. I was. I, thanks for saying Goldeneye. That reminds me. I was. I was going for uh for Perfect Dark was, you know, because Rareware used to be like, a uh, Nintendo exclusive developer, and then we saw them move to Xbox and then just die. Actually, I think they were acquired by Microsoft, but. And then see, no, and and again, that's like a Perfect Dark. I've heard of that title. I don't even know that game. That's maybe. Two or three years before I really started. Playing that that was that was uh, rare. Made all of the like classic Nintendo games you can think of. They made Donkey Kong Country. They made Banjo Kazooie. They made GoldenEye, and then they made like the spiritual successor to GoldenEye that was its own independent storyline called Perfect Dark. And it's like you're a secret agent, and there's like aliens and stuff. And it was, I mean, it was amazing. You know, it was like. Gameplay was GoldenEye Plus, and then it had its own crazy set of weapons and own crazy story. and was a great game, and that was one of the big console exclusives toward the end of the N64's lifespan. And then they released, uh, I believe Microsoft bought out Rare, because they started releasing Xbox games, and then they were all terrible, and then just bad. Well, I think one of the questions you mentioned just a moment ago was why don't I guess PC companies are, or why doesn't Microsoft, why do we not have these exclusive PC titles? And I, I, maybe you already answered the question, I just wasn't hearing it right, but it probably has something to do with the fact that 
you know, consoles are the base. When you when I look, if I went out and I, I told you I've gone through two or three laptops in the past couple of years. When I go out laptop shopping, I know I'm going to end up spending anywhere between five hundred to seven hundred dollars. And when I'm looking for the capabilities of my equipment, sure, I'm looking for maybe the graphics card and you know what it can handle. I'm looking at memory and things like that. But what I'm going to use it for is a whole long list of things. It's you know for work, for school, for I don't know uh, my video games. It's it's for everything, not just entertainment. If but, I'm going out to buy a console, all I'm looking for is that base. All I'm looking for is okay. Can it? It does it have? I don't know. Can I run Netflix on it? Can I? But at the same time, though, when you look at what you do on on a PC, you know things like work and school. Unless you're doing graphic designing or video editing, you don't need any capability on on your computer to, you know, to check your email, browse the internet, run Microsoft Word. I mean, the, you don't like I that's that, that's what Jordan that's Grillo point. does. Should, you know, he sells. I should retract. I should retract machines. capabilities and just and just focus and say, I, I guess it's price. When you're going out shopping for a PC or for a laptop. I imagine a lot of the time your range of prices is going to be higher than it would be for a console. Okay. I would I would agree with that. But then you know, you look at it's it's not it's not a hardware provider that is is sort of pumping out you know games for one or the other. It's it's the it's the developers. And the developers clearly need the money from the wider audience base but we've seen examples even in modern day of of publishers or of uh you know the companies that run the console themselves the hardware producers shelling out enough money to sort of get those exclusive titles i mean it but it's much more rare now than it was at one point in time I mean, I guess we probably don't know enough about the economics of the industry. <laughs> well, that's, that's one of the things I'm, I'm sitting here pondering, like, oh, why do they do that? And I, I can't give you an answer. Like, I can't even speculate as to why developers wouldn't do that. I mean, do you do you have any theories yourself? Well, you been... I, you know, it. I remember the, well, you know, what started the modern day Soulsborne series was Demon Souls, which was a PS3 exclusive. And the reason they made Dark Souls instead of Demon Souls 2 was they said, wow, this game is highly successful and everybody wants to play it. If we were able to make a version of it on all available platforms, we'd make a lot more money. And so, you know, they and Sony had uh, the rights to the Demon Souls franchise. They had purchased the publishing rights through Atlas. And... So we, we ended up with Dark Souls instead of Demon Souls 2. And, you know, it, obviously Dark Souls has turned into one of the most successful, I think probably the most successful, like, currently being released gaming franchise or up there. Um, but then you look back at, they did go back to an exclusive with Bloodborne. I mean, Sony, you know, obviously understood what kind of revenue that would that would pump out and shelled out the money and it ended up being worth it because i remember i saw an interview with uh one of the heads of sony's gaming division and they said you know we paid a lot to get the exclusive rights on bloodborne and we had no idea how much money it was going to make us it was they knew it was a souls game and they but they didn't they couldn't fathom just how successful it was going to be especially on ps4 which is i mean you know ps4 won the modern day console war but this current generation fell off pretty hard from the last one. So, it, I I don't know as much. I haven't even taken a look at Bloodborne really. I so I know good. it it crossed my path, and I know when I saw a couple of trailers and when I saw some gameplay footage, I thought in my head of like it looks like Dark Souls. There are definitely some things in there that that make me jump to Dark Souls, but I had no idea what it was. I didn't know if it was just going to be a play on that. Is it just somebody well, else's interpretation? No, 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 no. It's, it's made by, it's made by FromSoft and it's a, it's a Miyazaki title. It's the guy who, you know, the guy who invented the Souls franchise made it directly. So it's not even just the same company. It's the same dev team. That's why Dark Souls 2 was 
made by a different development team is because the Dark Souls team was working on Bloodborne. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's, really, it's clearly a Soulsborne game. Well, that's why people are saying Soulsborne instead of Souls franchise now. It's because, it's because of Bloodborne. But it's clearly a like Souls game in the gameplay aspects. I mean, there are obviously new innovations to it, and the combat pacing is very different. You feel actually a lot of the DNA from the combat in uh, Dark Souls 3. It's, uh, it's much faster paced and, you know, no upgraded armor and things like that. Um, but yeah, it, it, it obviously has, I mean, I, I don't want to start, yeah, I could go on for hours about Bloodborne, but the story in it is, is phenomenal. And we have this title that it's one of the reasons I don't regret getting a PS4. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty nice Blu-ray player, a very expensive one if you think about it, but then you look at the games that are worth playing on it and I think the, the best title I have on PS4 far and away was was Bloodborne. And that actually Souls is Yeah, we're getting a little short on time, so I want to sort of steer the conversation. Uh Souls is an interesting idea too because you look at you know Dark Souls uh has been very successful on the PC. I know I bought Dark Souls 1 on PC even though I already had it on PlayStation and I think I did the same with 2 because 2 was first released on uh console by like a month and so i think i got it on console and then went back and got it on pc uh and of course three i got only on on pc because it was released at the same time but then when you play a souls game on pc it's a really like shitty port of an xbox game I mean, you know, you, you can be playing on your keyboard, which you shouldn't... First of all, you, can, you can't really play the game on the keyboard. I know one guy who beat Dark Souls 1 on keyboard. It took him, like, six months. I mean, it's like you walk forward with W, but then you swing with, like, L or something. It's terrible. Um, but then... That's, that's graphic. Yeah. That's actually... That's pretty terrible. It's terrible. Um, and it's, like, real time, but it's the, there's input delay because it has to convert... So yeah, that's one of the things. It's like when you hit the button to use an item or like open a chest, it takes forever to do it because it converts the input from your keyboard like internally to an Xbox command and then does it. And like if you're on your keyboard and you walk up to a chest, it won't say like, oh, press T to open. It'll say like, press the green Xbox A button to open the box. I mean, it's just... God, well, and awful. I, I have not played any of the. I actually don't think I've any played any of the Soul series on my on my laptop. The only game I've I think I've spent. Well, no, I've spent a lot of time playing Fallout both on my laptop and on my console. Played Skyrim a lot on both. In in terms of a little bit more fast paced, CS:GO is actually one where I've at least in the past couple months I've spent a lot of time playing CS:GO on my console and I've found uh, yeah, that Yeah, I'm going to be honest, until you said it, I didn't realize CS:GO was available on console. It's not the first thing you think of when you think like console arcade game. You don't think, "Oh yeah, I, I'm going to go play Counter-Strike." Well, like one of the only current esport competitive FPSs. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I'm I'm the person who's once or twice tried to play like free to play shooters with a touchpad. Oh and man, that's bad. I, I well and and it's kind of a similar feeling when you not not nearly as clunky or as difficult when you play it or uh, play CS:GO on on a, a console, but there is this this difference. It's uh, well, for instance, you know, you look at when you click a mouse and you compare that action, just that that little action of clicking a mouse right. to the time it takes to pull a trigger on let's say an Xbox controller, there's a little bit of delay and things like that when you switch from one one platform to another. And so, for instance, like I, I've spent some time with CS:GO on the console, but that's one of those few where I, I actually don't like playing it on console as much because you have things like that, and it just it doesn't. The game is not as good on a different platform. And well, What's I know the. Overwatch is on, you know, console and PC, and it has different balance teams for different platforms, because certain characters are just drastically better when you have a mouse. Like, there's a, there's the sniper character, Widowmaker, is much, much better on PC, because 
when you have a one shot kill point and click, you know, you have to drag the uh the joystick over there on a controller, but when you have a mouse you can just high sensitivity just pop directly into their head. Or another character like Bastion who can set himself up as a turret. I mean he's he's a joke on PC because you just lob grenades at him from around a corner, but then when you have to like sit there and aim at him, he kills you every time. Well, and I, I suppose that's yeah. I, I really like that you brought up specifically. Uh, what was it, Widowmaker, with the the one shot kill aspect? Like that's that's something else that kind of did. One of the differences, one of the reasons I don't like CS:GO on the on the console when you have to move a joystick in order to aim, right. it takes a lot longer, and it's just not the game doesn't feel as fast paced. You have to move slower. It feels like you're playing with a bunch of five year olds who just started gaming, and you are one of the five year olds. Yeah, well, I'm not sure if you rem- if you knew this, but I'm like a, or I was like a, very minorly professional Halo Two player, and I I believe I did. I think you had told me that before. <laughs> if anybody's wondering, you will not be able to find any of my work on the internet. I was on a team very very briefly. It did not work out, but that was one of the aspects of competitive gameplay in Halo Two was. It was all about knowing the jumps on each map, and it's because if you jumped from certain angles, you would be aiming towards where they were standing and their head would be, but they wouldn't be able to adjust their crosshair, like from, like if you jumped this way, they'd be able to adjust and shoot you just as fast in the head. If you did this jump, they wouldn't be able to aim up into the right fast enough, and so you would win firefights by, by just the nature of you couldn't aim that fast on a controller. Whereas in PC, that's not an issue. I remember, you know, I used to play Alien vs. Predator 2. It was one of my favorite FPSs way back in the day. And I had my mouse sensitivity so high that, you know, I could just, like, barely flip my wrist and I'd do a full 180 and be behind me. And it could still be precise. Whereas if you try to jack the sensitivity up to max on your controller's joystick, you still can't control it. It's just awful. But... Well, and maybe that's something that we haven't really put enough time to in this conversation is just the difference in controls. Now, I, I know I mentioned it at the very beginning of the podcast how, you know, it could be something tactile. But, no, there is there's definitely a difference in the control schemes. And For there's sure. Differences. You didn't yeah, play I mean, depending Shadow on Run, what did you? What one? Shadow? Shadow Run? Shadow Run was the first game where they were like, oh, we can connect Xbox to new windows and so it was a first person shooter that was available on both and it was awful because console players console players couldn't even crack like the top thousands of players because they just got destroyed by everybody with a mouse and keyboard i can't say i'm surprised i mean that in my head that's almost the same as like pitting the people playing CSGO on Xbox like I do and pitting them against the guys on PC or on a laptop. Like, it's just, that. why would you do that? Putting why your, would you do that put, to people? Putting your high school football team up against, uh, you know, the NFL. Call it a day. I don't know. I think, I think one of those is clearly more painful than the other. <laughs> is it the CSGO? Is that, is yeah. that more painful? Oh, definitely. <laughs> If you've if you've ever played any first person shooter with a touchpad, you 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 have a whole new perspective. You have a whole new outlook on life. See, but I think that also brings up a, an interesting point, though. That you know that was a game available on both you know PC and and um, and console. And then, you know, we look at a game like Dark Souls, which is, I think, now predominantly a PC game, but still uses console controls, and you have to play it on a game. Well, you basically have to play it on a gamepad. Do you think we're going to see more of that in the future, where games are going to try to break down the barriers between... Because, I mean, if you're playing something like an RPG or an adventure game, you could probably have them on even multiplayer on you know, both platforms and have them play together and it wouldn't be a huge deal. I think that's how, uh, that's how, I think the the earliest example of this I can think of is Final Fantasy XI, which was the original Final Fantasy MMORPG, was available on the PlayStation 2 as well as PC. And it didn't really matter because the game, it's, it was very different from MMO. The game was like pseudo turn-based. 
And so people on controller could do things just as fast as everybody on keyboard could do. And so it, it wasn't an issue. Did 11 have anything... Was the combat scheme anything similar to 12? The combat scheme of 12... 11 was the prototype for 12, yeah. So you run around in real time and have combat yeah. in real time. But then like when you want to do an attack, you like hit the button, it brings up a menu, you select attack, and then a second later it like swings. It's that like right. it's like kind of real time, but it, you can tell it's like basically still turn based. Oh yeah, no, I'm and I've I've had a little bit of experience with that one, and I, and they did kind of the same thing with what was it? Uh, you probably didn't play it because it was a it was a handheld console game, but Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core, which was I like I did not the, play Crisis Core. I got I mean, it for a that, second. I'm like, I've got I've got a I've got a Vita. I'm cool. I've got. Then, oh no! This was this was way back in PSP, and, and no way. it wasn't that popular of a game, but it was it had something similar. And I mean, do I think that people are going to see more and more of that? I I don't know. Well, I, I, I mean, suppose. You, well, here's here's sort of here's sort of we'll say is like the the end all question. Do you think we're they are going to aim to reach a point where it, we have sort of no barrier where people are really like you make one game it's assumed it's going to go on everything and it's going to assume people play together yes but if i was not going to just simply answer it i think the answer lies in vr gaming i think that's i, I think that might be the end game there we've got to we've got to solve the space issue first well, VR games no. are currently limited to you either not in real VR on a keyboard, or you get a five foot area to stick stay in, and then you're then you're set. No, we just you know you need you need a tent in the backyard. That's that's how they'll do it. All right. Well, that's we are out of time. Thanks everybody for joining us. My guest this week has been Matthew. We discussed console games again. Matthew is going to be on YouTube real soon with uh with a gopro and some weapons and tactical gear there will be a link in the description below somewhere down here as soon as he's up it'll be there and i will also be sure to give him some love on twitter and other social medias but anyway thanks for joining everybody hope you guys enjoyed the podcast matthew any parting words uh thanks for having me and good night and good luck to everybody else Ooh, bringing out the uh the moreau all right Take it easy, everybody. I will see you guys next time.